Hello, pattern readers, and welcome to another How to Adapt video. If you missed it, you might want to check out my foundational video where I talk about book to screen changes and what makes them necessary. In this video, I'm going to focus on the character of Moiraine and how she will need to be adapted for the upcoming Wheel of Time TV series where she will be played by Rosamund Pike. But wait, what? This isn't just a how to adapt video. That's right, I have an official teaser to share and break down for you. This past Watt Wednesday, we got our first official look at Rosamund in character as Moraine. It's only a few seconds, so I'll loop it a couple times for you. And then the showrunner Rafe Judkins generously answered some Moraine related questions. And now here's Moraine. Do not underestimate the women in this tower. Do not underestimate the women in this tower. I'm also going to share the caption Rosamund Pike wrote when she shared this video. She called Maureen a woman of mystery, power, calm, and strength. Maureen Sedai is an enigma and a force of nature, never to be underestimated. See a flash of her here as she embraces the source of the one power. This tells me that she understands the character. It also confirms that Moraine is embracing Sidar here, not yet channeling. I strongly suspect what looks like fire in the background suggests that this is likely a shot of Winter Night or Beltine when the Trollocs have attacked. The strong sound effects and wind blowing back her hair are pretty intense. I'm unsure what to make of the wind. It seems likely there will be some sound effects connected to channeling in the show, but also I suspect that this is a shot that will be used in a longer trailer, so the sound effects may not match what we see in the show. But I love her expression and the way they've managed to make her look like she has a completely natural, no makeup face, even though of course she is wearing makeup for the camera. To help us actually break down what we are seeing and hearing here, we have some input from Rafe Judkins. He clarifies that the audio of Moraine speaking was recorded specifically for this teaser and does not appear in the show. That takes out a lot of potential speculation about who she was speaking to or where she was when she said this, but it's really good to know. If you were someone wondering why Moraine isn't wearing her blue jewel called a Kessiera in the shot, Rafe assured us we will see it in the show. You might also have wondered if they were going to do any digital manipulation to produce the ageless effect of eyes to eye faces that is described in the book. To me, it comes as no surprise that they will not. As Rafe says, it's simply too expensive to touch every frame of so many characters. Rafe shares that the moment Moraine walks into the Winespring Inn was big for him, which does make me wonder if that might be the first shot we see of her. It might make for a grander entrance to see how the villagers react to seeing a woman like they've never seen before. This next answer where Rafe explains that Rosamond and the other actresses were each able to build their own gestures and expressions they would use when channeling is very much in keeping with the books, where it is described that gestures of any kind are wholly unnecessary, yet if a woman learns to use them, they become inseparable from the weave. This makes each channeler's precise method unique. This next one, where Rafe assures there will be LGBT representation in the show, while including a rainbow pride flag as well as a transgender pride flag, fits right into my previous How to Adapt video, where I talked about how to adapt the book's romances. I believe one of the best early examples of LGBT representation to develop and include is the romance between Moiraine and Swan, so check out that previous video for more on that. Finally, and most relevant for the rest of this video is this one, where he says that above all else, Moraine is a woman who is driven to do what she believes is right at any cost. Quick spoiler warning, the rest of this video will contain spoilers through book five, as well as some light spoilers for the prequel New Spring. I recommend not watching the rest of this video if you haven't read through Fires of Heaven. And towards the end, I will talk about something that has an impact on full book spoilers. And I'll warn you again when we get to that point, if you want to click off. There are three main areas of focus that I want to cover when it comes to how to adapt Moraine. First, what are the challenges the book character presents as written for developing a character for the streaming series? In other words, what might be difficult to take directly from page to screen and might require some creative thinking or changes. Next, what is essential to the character of Moraine that the show is going to want to capture? And third, what kinds of changes might the show make in order to address the challenges and maintain the essence of Moraine? First, some context about what we can guess about Moraine's role in the show. 
The early press releases that describe what the show is about have Moraine as central to it. She's often the only character that's mentioned by name. Of the many casting announcements we've gotten since, Rosamund Pike was the first. She's also probably the most recognizable name in the cast. It's very likely that the marketing of the show will center around Rosamund Pike and her character. And yet, Moraine is not as prominent a character in the books, as this would suggest she might be in the early seasons of the show anyway. In book one, of course, she's a very important figure, but she only has one tiny POV at the end. In book two, she has more POVs. Specifically, she has five. But she also disappears for a huge chunk of the middle of the book. But this will turn out to be the maximum number of POV chapters she has in any book outside of the prequel New Spring, which is centered on Moraine. But not having a lot of POV chapters doesn't equate to not being an important character. There are books where Rand has nary a POV. But it does mean we spend a lot more time looking at Moraine from an external perspective. This allows the books to have Moraine be more of a mystery and have other characters and even readers questioning how much they can trust her or what her exact motives are. So this sets up a challenge. How can they keep Moraine a mystery but still have her be an active presence throughout in those early seasons? And how can they structure their narrative to avoid Moraine being absent for one or multiple episodes in a row, as she probably would be if they stuck to the exact sequence of events in the books? Now, I'm assuming that minimizing Moraine's absence is something they would want, given the casting of Rosamund Pike and the framing of Moraine as central to the show, at least in the first season or two. Now let's talk about what I consider to be essential to Moraine. Number one is the supreme importance of Moraine's mission. She is absolutely dedicated to protecting the Dragon Reborn and helping him make it to the last battle safe and able to defeat the Dark One. Now, as Rafe suggests, she is more than willing to sacrifice any other concerns for the purpose of achieving that goal. Doesn't mean she doesn't consider other concerns, but if they're ever in conflict, she never forgets what her purpose is. Next, I think there's an essential tension in Moraine's personality, where she's pulled between two extremes and ultimately trying to find the right balance. On one extreme are her instincts and training towards manipulation, secrecy, and calm, cool, Aes Sedai control. This is the Moraine that wants to keep Rand in her grasp and be the one envisioning and executing exactly how events will unfold. On the other extreme holds her temper, her mind for pranks, her vulnerability, her ability to connect. And somewhere in between these two extremes lies the Moraine that gets Rand to listen to her and begins to repair the trust that she damaged with her secrecy and manipulation. I think we see the first extreme at the beginning of The Eye of the World and the second extreme in New Spring, where she's really only play acting at coolness and calmness. And then at the end of Fires of Heaven, her balance has been struck. Lastly, it's important to mention Maureen's essential relationships. She has many that are important, but I think the most critical are Swan, Lan, and Rand. So the show will have to devote enough attention to her dynamics with these three. Wrapped up somewhat in her relationship with Swan is also her relationship to the White Tower as a whole. She's one of the most powerful Aes Sedai in existence at the beginning of the story, and yet she's not necessarily well thought of in Tarvalin. She goes her own way. She doesn't spend a lot of time there to maintain the friendship she had in training. I would call her unorthodox, despite exemplifying the Aes Sedai in some ways. Now, let's get to some changes the show might need to make in order to tackle the challenges that Moraine's character presents and still maintain her essence. Rosamond calls Moraine an enigma. So, how is the show going to cause other characters and new audience members to have some doubts about Moraine's intentions while still presenting her actions as in line with what we know her true intentions to be? So right away, she shows up in Emmons Field right before the Trollocs attack. This is what in the book causes the villagers to question her, even though they have seen her channel to kill Shadowspawn. And this is what leads to her iconic Manetheran speech. But I will say that I don't think any of this actually did make me question her in the books. It read to me more like the narrow-minded, isolationist mindset of this small village led some to unfairly attack her. 
I think this is for a couple of reasons. It's mainly characters like the Coplins, the Congers, and Sen Bui who are questioning Moraine, while characters who are presented as more reasonable are coming to her defense and pointing out what she did to save them. Then there's the Manetheran speech itself, which I think pretty effectively shames the villagers for those small-minded attitudes. So if they keep all of those things the same and actually show us Moraine channeling to protect the village, I think we'd be pretty firmly on her side. I think we absolutely need to see more of the attack, and that will include Moraine channeling and Lan fighting to kill Shadowspawn. But I think it's possible to have a more reasonable character question her. And if it's done in the right way, she might not have a good answer. For instance, is it a coincidence that she arrived in the village just before the Shadowspawn? No, it's not. She didn't bring them, but it's not a coincidence. But not wanting to reveal what she's really doing there, she might give an evasive Aes Sedai answer to a question like that. And a character like Tam might be able to point that out and raise some doubts. I've speculated before, based on this concept art, that the Trollic attack might occur during the big Beltine celebration in Emmons Field, not the night before. And I brought up how that might mean that Rand and Tam would already be in the village rather than on their farm when the attack occurs. I had trouble with the idea that they might need to go to the farm to get Tam's sword. But I got some useful comments on that point, including this detailed one from Andrew Berenson that I agree with. They can make a point of having Rand and Tam rattled enough ahead of time that Tam brings his sword. What's the point of all this? Well, we might not get a scene of Rand dragging an injured Tam through the woods back to the village. We might not get Tam's fever dream because it might be too big a clue to reveal right away that Rand is not his biological son. And we might not get Tam needing to be healed by Moraine. Her healing of Tam is another thing that earns her some trust, and so that might be taken away. We should also consider a possibility that might hurt book fans the most. Would they consider cutting Moraine's Manetheran speech? It might slow down the momentum of the episode when they're trying to set up urgency for them to leave the village right away. It's also something that earns Moraine some trust, and they might want to do away with that. I'm not necessarily saying I'm advocating for this, but she could also give that speech at another time. It all depends on how they're putting all the pieces together. And I can at least see these reasons why they might not want to include it in the first episode. In episode two, we know from a leak that the fairy master in Tarn Ferry, Master Hightower, is killed after they cross the river. This is a change from the books where the fairy is sunk, but he survives. We know from the three oaths that it's not possible that Moraine intentionally caused his death. And it's also unlikely that her actions accidentally led to his death but it's still something that could make for a stronger argument against her, and it's one that's likely to be made by one or more of the Emmons fielders at that point. As I've talked about previously, one of the changes I think the show will make is to have Moraine, as well as Lan and Nynaeve, meet up with a group of Aes Sedai who have captured Loghain while they're split from the rest of the group. One of the things this can accomplish, among others, is to establish that Moraine isn't exactly in favor among all of the Aes Sedai, and it can set up different factions. We might even be starting to learn about the Black Aja. This can be another way they play up those doubts. Despite all these potential opportunities to cast doubt on Moraine, I think as the season goes on, they should be building towards a big reveal, and that reveal might be twofold. One, that Rand is the Dragon Reborn, or Moraine believes he is. And two, exactly what this mission is that Moraine and Swan have been on for the past 20 years or so. We might still have some doubts about exactly what they intend with him now that they've found him. But even with this in mind, I think we might be feeling much more favorable towards Moraine at the end than we might be at some points in the middle. I think one way to gradually build towards this reveal and control what pieces of information are revealed when are to build in flashbacks of Moraine and Swan throughout the season. Flashbacks need not be linear, and they can be carefully selected to help shape how we view the characters. And it would also serve to really strengthen and illustrate that crucial relationship. Season two, as I alluded to, could have the challenge of Moraine being off screen for most of what happens in The Great Hunt. For this reason, and for many others, the scenario I can most envision for adaptation in season two is one I laid out when I did a guest panel on the Dusty Wheel, but I do plan to do my own video on this topic where I go in detail into how books two and three, and even a part of book four, can be streamlined into season two. 
In brief, it would involve blending similar plot lines from books two and three to avoid repetition, and by moving the destination for the Horn and the Shanchan to near Tyr instead of Falma, we could have Moraine following a similar plot line to The Dragon Reborn with elements of the Great Hunt, and it would accomplish two things for her. One, she's not off screen. And two, we dive right into the conflict between her and Rand, where she's trying to control him and he is seeking freedom. Why do I think it's important to get to that tension between them sooner? Well, if I'm right about how far the show can advance in season two, then I think it's also likely that by season three, we can have gotten through books four and five, and it will probably end with Moraine and Lanfear going through that twisted doorway. If I'm right, and we have three seasons before Moraine is gone, it makes sense to me that in season two is where we see that tension and distrust building, and in season three is where she starts to regain his trust. It's easier to build that tension between them if they interact more in season two. And then we might start season three with him holding her at an arm's length and her desperate to get through to him, which gives her motivation to change her approach. Bottom line, we need to feel Rand's loss when he reads her letter. And we'll get there by seeing them get to a hard-won place of trust. Now is the part where I'm going to start talking about some things that involve full series spoilers. So if you need to click off, please subscribe and leave me a comment. How do you think they're going to handle Moraine in the first few seasons? And what do you think is essential about her? So what does the show do with Rosamund Pike and Moraine when Moraine apparently dies? Rafe Judkins has said they are approaching the adaptation of this as a series as a whole, not each book individually. So they likely already have an idea of how this is going to go. I can see two very broad possibilities, and each one depends on Rosamund Pike. Just to prepare you, I'm going to be talking about some extreme possibilities here. They're certainly not all going to be true, but I think they're all worth considering. And they're all predicated on what it might take to get an actor of the caliber of Rosamund Pike involved with this show in the first place. So let's say in scenario number one, that Rosamund Pike is willing to stay committed to the show throughout its entire run. She probably wouldn't want to be sidelined for seasons. So could they create a shorter absence for her? If they wanted us to believe that she's really dead, she should probably disappear for at least most of a season, though they might be able to use her for new flashbacks during that time, maybe even have her direct some episodes, and by the end of that next season reveal that she isn't dead. They might be able to show us some scenes of Moraine with the Finns in the next season. But I do think that keeping Moraine in Finland for a long time wouldn't work very well. It would end up feeling like Fayil's interminable capture with the Shido. Could they arrange to have her rescued earlier? Probably. Though that would also involve having a vision for what Moraine's storyline after rescue would be. And it would impact the timing of Matt's plot. This is definitely a scenario that would involve a lot of changes from the books. But what if Rosamund Pike hasn't committed to staying involved for the entire run of the show? An actor like Pike probably has a lot of say in her contracts and doesn't have to lock herself in for a long run. I can see two sub possibilities here. One is that she's signed up for a specific number of seasons if the show is picked up. I'd guess three based on my estimates for how the show might progress. And she might be open to the possibility of returning after that, but there would be no guarantee of it. And the second sub possibility here is that she has agreed to sign up for a specific number of seasons and then made it clear that she doesn't want to return after that. In either of those cases, the show would probably be writing as if Moraine is really dead and gone. No Tom subtly carrying around a letter for seasons. No Min alluding to a vision that failed. Maybe no half the light of the world prophecy. If Rosamund Pike agreed to come back for the end, they would probably have enough warning to build in some foreshadowing before that happened. But they should also, in any scenario where they don't have a guarantee of Rosamund Pike coming back, be prepared for what they would do if she didn't. They should already be thinking about how they would write the end if Moraine stayed dead. Would Matt go to the Tower of Genji and give up his eye for another reason? Or would that not make it in? How would the field of Marilor change? Who would join Rand and Nynaeve in the circle with Kalindor? It's not impossible, my friends. 
I'm sorry to have to even raise such thoughts, but that's the purpose of this, right? To help us think through the reasons why certain big changes might be ahead of us and to help us gird our loins. Let me know your thoughts.